Uh, so thank you and good afternoon. It's nice to see so many people stuck around right to the end. Uh, and I also want to thank the EMU Planning Committee for the invitation to speak on the main stage today for the first time. Uh, it's an invitation of great honor and met with a lot of excitement and also probably an equal amount of terror. Uh, I have no conflicts to declare, uh, except for the existential conflict I'm currently experiencing right now in front of all of you. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about headache nightmares. And in particular, I'm going to share a blind spot in my clinical practice that I discovered. So if you're like me, and the way I was just recently, I had a very simple approach to headaches. I made three decisions. I decided if the patient required analgesia, if they benefit from a plain CT of their brain, and if they benefit from the diagnostic utility of an LP. And I thought if I did those three things well, I was an excellent emergency physician. And not to say that those decisions are easy to make. Each of them can pose their own challenges but it's selecting from a very limited menu. And I've since discovered that this actually approach, this approach is grossly inadequate. So the next 100 patients that you'll see in your emergency department with a headache, 98 of them will be fine. 98 of them will be fine, regardless of your ability to accur accurately diagnose their headache. Because they have a benign headache, they have a benign primary headache. But two of those patients will have a life-altering, life-threatening headache. And if we look at these two patients, only one of them will be readily identifiable by an LP or a CT, because only one of them will be represented by either meningitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if you rely on a CT and an LP to diagnose your worrisome headaches, that's where you're hanging your hat you are missing 50% of the worrisome headaches that are presenting to your emergency department. And that's why I want to show you today and share with you the big five headaches you have to assess in every patient that presents your ED with an acute headache. You have to not only think subarachnoid hemorrhage and meningitis, but you have to think cervical dissection, a cerebral sinus venous thrombosis, and carbon monoxide poisoning. So for the next 12 minutes, I'm going to share you the uh, stories of three different patients that presented to the ED with an acute headache. All three of these patients received a CT scan in the emergency department. All three of these patients had their CT read as normal. One of these patients had an LP. The LP was normal as well. <clears throat> Here's our first patient. It's a 44-year-old male. He's a small business owner. He's on his way into work. He stops at an intersection. He develops an occipital headache, and then quickly notices that he has trouble seeing the stop sign in his right field of vision. He goes to the emergency department. In the emergency department, he gets some analgesia. He says his pain is somewhere between six to eight out of 10. And then by the time he's seen by a physician, he says his vision has improved. His neurologic exam is normal. There's no visual field defect on examination. Nonetheless, this is a person who was previously healthy, no history of migraines, no stroke risk factors, but he had an occipital headache and a visual field loss. So he got a CT. I'm gonna show you a couple slices of a CT and spend a couple seconds on each slice. I want you to look closely and see if you see anything. We're gonna go start from the bottom and go up. Look closely, do you see anything? Just a couple slices left. Anyone see an abnormality? Put up your hand if you thought you saw an abnormality couple people. I'll tell you, don't feel bad if you didn't see an abnormality because this CT was read as normal. <clears throat> and I read the CT as normal. And even retrospectively, knowing what the final diagnosis is, I read the CT as normal. So what are you thinking now? You got a 40-year-old guy who had an onset of a headache and a transient visual loss. Both the headache and the visual loss have improved. 
or almost completely resolved. The nurse actually documents in the chart, patient now reports his pain is one out of 10, if that. What would you do? I'll tell you what I did. I went and spoke to one of my trusted colleagues, a colleague whose opinion I respect greatly. And uh, he's in the audience right now, so I won't use his name. But I went up to him and I said, Walter, <laughs> I have a 40-year-old guy here who had a sudden onset headache and a transient visual loss. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable calling it a migraine. He has never had a migraine before. But I, I'm wondering if it could be a TIA, but I'm like, how am I going to sort this out? And he said, I'll tell you exactly what you need to do. You need to determine the timing of his symptoms. Did the deficit come on suddenly? If it came on suddenly, you have to think TIA. Or did it come on slowly? That's consistent with the migraine. Well, I was pretty sure that his deficits came on suddenly, because it all happened when he came to the uh, stop sign. So he said, the next thing you gotta do is you gotta get a CTA. And so Walter seemed pretty confident that I needed to order a CTA, so I ordered a CTA, but I didn't know what I was looking for. I'll show you what it showed. That little green arrow is showing a dissection at the origin of his right vertebral artery. A little, then what that is is a thrombus on that dissection. I'll show you a little zoom in here. So on that dissection is a thrombus, and that thrombus is an embolic source. And it's showering emboli to his posterior circulation. He had a visual cortex TIA. That's what he had. And I'll show you here, that new green arrow, that shows his normal left vertebral artery. This yellow arrow, that shows a near invisible right vertebral artery. So this opened my eye to the diagnosis of a vertebral artery dissection. There's some eye-opening things about this disease. It's a disease of young people. It's a disease of young people who have no classic stroke risk factors. These aren't people with hypertension, diabetes, and atrial fibrillation. 25% of strokes under the age of 50 are caused by cervical artery dissections. Head and neck pain are the hallmark of this disease. And these patients can also present with a thunderclap headache. 20% of these patients can present with a thunderclap headache. The other thing they showed me is beware of the migraine masqueraders. Because these are young patients with headaches and funny neurologic symptoms, be very wary of diagnosing a patient with their first migraine. Be very wary of diagnosing a patient with their first migraine. If it's a deficit, meaning it's not shimmering lights and colors, if it's a loss of vision, if it's a loss of ability to speak, if it's a clumsy hand, you have to think TIA. And if the deficits came on suddenly, you have to think. TIA. And if it's a young person with a TIA, you have to think for tubal artery dissection. Our second case is a 44-year-old woman. She's a legal clerk. She experiences the textbook thunderclap headache while at work. The textbook thunderclap headache. Sudden, maximal at onset, severe headache while at work with associated nausea, vomiting, and photophobia. She arrives in the emergency department appearing uncomfortable, shielding her eyes from the light. She's slightly hypertensive, she gets analgesia, and she rightfully gets a CT scan to rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. She's noted to be previously healthy, has a history of anxiety and reflux. She's on amitriptyline and pentoprazole. And I'll show you her scan. And once again, I want you to look closely. Anyone see anything? Now, by a show of hands, does anyone think they saw anything on this CT scan? Well, the few brief souls that were brave enough to put up their hands, if you did see the right abnormality, you're smarter than our radiologist, because the CT scan was read as normal. Less impressively, you were smarter than me, because I read the CT scan as normal as well. 
So I had a patient with a sudden onset headache. It seemed like a classic thunderclap headache. And I was wondering, should I LP this patient? They got their headache less than six hours. But part of me wondered, is this one of those subtle sub uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages that could be missed by a non-neuroradiologist? We don't have neuroradiologists reading our scans. So I proceeded with the LP. It's normal. Hmm. Well, where does this leave us? She definitely doesn't have subarachnoid hemorrhage. I've done an LP. She's had a CT read as normal. Doesn't have meningitis. The LP is normal. She doesn't have a fever. She could be a cervical artery dissection. There's a thunderclap headache, but she has no focal neurologic deficits. She's not carbon monoxide poisoning. No one else was sick at her office. So this left CSVT out on the table. I walk back in the room and ask her the following questions. I go, are you on a birth control pill? She goes, no. I go, are you pregnant? And she goes, definitely not. So I then throw out this one question going, you ever had a DVT before? She goes, actually, I've had two. And I look back at her chart, and it says anxiety and reflux and just amitriptyline and pentoprazole. I'm like, why are you on a blood thinner? <clears throat> well, she explains that when she moved from the U.S. to Canada, she ran out of her medication. She had trouble finding a primary care physician. When she finally found her a GP, her biggest daily concerns were anxiety and her reflux. She thought, you know what, the clot wasn't a big issue. That was years ago. So she got held to the morning to get an MRV, a magnetic resonance venogram. And here it is. And that's what it shows. An empty delta sign in the sagittal sinus. She had a clot in her sagittal sinus. And to my embarrassment, when you look back in the CT, it was there all along. She had a hyperacute thrombus in her sagittal sinus on the plain CT. That is an artifact. That isn't a strange tubercle on the occiput of her skull. That was a hyperacute thrombus. And if you would click into the bone window, you'd be able to make that distinction. So CSVT, here's another diagnosis you have to consider. This is a diagnosis that affects women more than men. Once again, a dangerous diagnosis that affects young people. The mean age is about 40. These are patients with DVT risk factors. It can also be caused by local spread of a sinus infection. And the CT is normal in 30% of these patients, and actually normal, not like this case. It, they are actually normal, 30% of patients. So what this told me, when you see a patient with a thunderclap headache, stay calm and keep your differential broad. You are not done when you rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Let me repeat that. You are not done assessing your patient when you rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage with patients presenting with thunderclap headache. You have to consider cervical artery dissections and CSVT. So my final patient, I guess you're going to figure out what the diagnosis is. It's the only one left for this patient, but I want to tell you the story in the few minutes I have left. It's a 32-year-old male, wakes up one morning with a bad headache, feels nauseous, gets out of bed, tries to make his way to the bathroom, presumably to vomit, takes a few steps, Faints, collapses, finds his way back to his feet, stumbles again, faints, collapses, gets up again. And on the third time, he faints and collapses one final time and hits his head on the doorknob of his bathroom door. This wakes up his entire family. They come rushing to him, quite concerned of how ill he looks. So they call the ambulance, get him sent to the hospital. His vital signs are stable when he arrives to the hospital. I see him about two hours later. So he's been in the department for about two hours by the time I see him. He says his headache's almost gone. I'm actually feeling pretty good. He goes, I don't know if I ate something funny. I had the family over last night. No one else is sick, though. OK. He goes, well, I don't know, maybe it was the wine, but I only had one glass of wine. OK. The story is concerning enough. I still he had a headache and syncope and vomiting. So he gets a scan. I'm only going to give you one slice here. This CT scan is normal. Go back here. So not really thinking the top four here, but I'll tell you what happened, and I wasn't thinking the bottom one either. As I'm repairing the laceration on his forehead, his brother walks in the room, just starts talking to me. I didn't ask him any questions. He goes, I don't know if this is relevant, Doc, but uh, he had the family over last night for dinner, and he let my parents sleep in his room. And he decided to sleep on a small cot he has in his basement. Once again, I just kept doing my simple interrupt as I, you know, doing my thing. And then he goes, you know what, I slept in his 
basement yesterday, and I woke up feeling sick. Well, I'm very thankful that he told me this, and I, this was not by any clinical, my personal clinical acumen or ability that he gave me this piece of information, but it became glaring obvious what this patient had. I sent off his carboxyhemoglobin level, and it was 30%. That, he, that was 30% after being in our department for four hours, which means that when he woke up that morning, his carbon monoxide level was 50, 60, lethally high, lethally high. You want me to tell you something great about carbon monoxide poisoning? It is the one time you will have a number needed to treat of less than one. Because you will not only save the life of the patients in the stretcher in front of you, you've now saved the lives of everyone in this house. So the fire department went over, detected the carbon monoxide levels, he had his furnace repaired, and carbon monoxide detectors installed. Huge difference. So toxic flu, carbon monoxide, when you see multiple people from a family with headache, nausea, and vomiting, and it's the middle of flu season, which is winter, before you label them a viral illness, ask them a few probing questions about carbon monoxide exposure. Is their furnace in good repair? Do they have carbon monoxide detectors? Is everyone in the house sick? And if you're suspicious of any of those questions, <coughs> just send the carboxyhemoglobin level. This is an easy diagnosis to make, provided you think of it. You have to think of it. And if you're fortunate enough to have one of those co-oximeters, put the probe on their finger. So here are the five take-home points, or my four take-home points. I saw it. Next time you assess a patient in your department with an acute headache, I want you to think of the big five. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, meningitis, cerebral artery dissection, CSVT, and carbon monoxide poisoning. And ask the right questions. For cervical artery dissection, ask about the timing of their symptoms. Confirm that it was a deficit so that you know that it's not a migraine and you have to consider TIA. For CSVT, ask them for DVT risk factors. Be very wary of diagnosing migraine for the first time in your department. And also, ask about carbon monoxide exposures. And finally, remember that not all thunderclap headaches are subarachnoid hemorrhages. And you are not done assessing your patient when you rule out a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You have to think of cervical artery dissections and CSVT. And so, I hope from this talk I've given you a, a key to success, to future clinical success in assessing your patients uh, so that you're no longer paralyzed by either uncertainty or in fear. Thank you very much.